Hi everyone, welcome to Triggered Precision Machine. It's a nice warm day up here in northern Idaho, so I figured it'd be a good day to talk about some more ballistics. So the last couple days we talked about how to build our trajectory cards or our dope cards, how to input the data into the calculator, what some of those different inputs meant, and where we have to be very accurate. So now let's talk about how to validate or true our ballistic data. So there's a lot of ways that people have done this in the past, and what I'm about to tell you is just kind of a a general rule that I use for all of my ballistic truing. There's a couple things we need to take care of before we can get started with the actual shooting portion of this. We need to make sure that our rifle and all of our data is correct. So first of all, we need to check our data and make sure that our inputs are correct and the output that we're getting is reasonable so we don't see any major outliers or things that seem out of place. Next, we need to make sure that our rifle is good to go. So, I always like to start this test with a reasonably clean bore. We've talked about that before, and I'm not meaning that we need to scrub all the copper out of the bore, but a reasonably clean rifle for all of these tests is absolutely crucial. So consistency is key. Then we need to make sure that our scope is leveled. That's a very critical process, and a lot of times when people mount scopes, they're not paying attention to how our reticle is oriented in relation to the bore, and a lot of people just eyeball the scope on there and try to line it up best they can. So there's some methods to accurately leveling your scope that we'll go through later, but suffice to say, it's very important to have an ac uh, accurately leveled scope. So we got to double check that. We also want to make sure we have a good zero on our rifle. Any deviation to the left, right, up or down of our point of aim is going to be magnified downrange just because of the angular nature of the bore and your line of sight. So we want to make sure that our point of impact is in line with our point of aim. After we have that, I like to predefine the distances that I'm going to true my ballistic data at. So a lot of times this is limited, like we talked about before, on the muzzle velocity or muzzle energy for your rifle if it's a hunting rifle. So you might have some theoretical limitation on your minimum energy for the particular animal that you're hunting and that would set your maximum range that you're going to zero at. On the other end of the spectrum, for a competition or match rifle where we might be shooting extreme long range or long range, we want to be familiar with the supersonic, transonic, and subsonic ranges. So to put this very briefly, supersonic is everything from Mach 1.2 and above. So typically when the rifle bullet leaves the barrel on these high powered rifle cartridges, it's at least Mach 2. So it's two times faster than the speed of sound. And that's why we get that supersonic crack when the bullet flies downrange. Between Mach 1.2 and 0.8 is known as the transonic range. And this is when the bullet has potential to lose stability. It's important to know this. So as the bullet is flying downrange, it's displacing the atmosphere and creating a pressure point somewhere on the bullet's axis. So as you enter that transonic range, this pressure point shifts and it can cause a yaw in the bullet, which can cause a wobble or some sort of ballistic instability. So it's important to know that range. And a lot of times, some bullets don't like to pass through that range without serious displacement or serious wobble. And you'll have keyholes and everything down at the subsonic range. Other bullets are a little bit more forgiving of going through this transonic range and retaining a little bit of stability. And it depends on the caliber, the rate of twist, the environmental conditions, and a whole bunch of other things. But it's worth testing and seeing for yourself. So once the bullet enters the subsonic range, then the bullet is obviously going slower than the speed of sound. And that might be a theoretical max for us for shooting a target or something like that. So it all depends on the accuracy we're getting at these distances and what your requirements are for the specific rifle. So back to what I was saying about predetermining our zeroing distances. So we mentioned a theoretical max distance for hunting and based on velocity or energy. Then we mentioned a theoretical max for competition shooting based on possibly the transonic range or the subsonic range or whenever the bullet loses stability. So as we go through our ballistic chart on JBM Ballistics, we saw that there is a mock column. So that gives us all of our mock values. So we want to look for that point when that bullet is entering Mach 1.2. And I usually make a little check mark there and that denotes that that is the beginning of the transonic range. Similarly, I'll look at Mach 1, and that's when the bullet is officially in the subsonic range. And then we go down to Mach 0.8, and that's the end of the transonic range. And everything below 0.8 is also subsonic range. So I like to make those yardages known, and I write them out on my card. 
And generally speaking, if I have the range to do it, I will zero at the transonic range right there at Mach 1.2, whatever that yardage is. And I'll also zero deep into the subsonic range below Mach 0.8. So that way I can test the stability of my ammo and it gives me a good idea of how my bullet is reacting downrange as far as the accuracy and everything else that we are looking for. So after we have our ranges predetermined, it's time to go out and find our shooting area. So we wanna choose a day when we have the best environmental conditions possible. So a hot day where there's a lot of mirage, a windy day where there's a lot of crosswind. Those aren't the best days to true your ballistic data, so it might be better to pack up and go back another day so you're not wasting your ammo. But suffice to say, the best possible conditions is what you want for truing your data. So a lot of times this is early in the morning or late in the evening. I usually choose one of those two and I find that those have the best chances of having good environmental conditions. Speaking of that, we also wanna track our envir environmental conditions when we're doing our ballistic truing. So write down the relative humidity, temperature, density, altitude, all these things that we need to input into our ballistic calculator and that we can use later on to help change our ballistic curve for different environmental conditions that we might travel to. And now we're ready to start shooting. So we have our scope leveled in relation to the bore, and then we have our accurate, statistically significant velocity average. We have our predetermined ranges based on transonic, supersonic, and subsonic ranges, or our theoretical max. And then we have our comfortable shooting position. And I can't overstate this enough how important building a comfortable shooting position is when you're doing any sort of shooting or especially this kind of testing. You have to build a comfortable position that allows you to have a good natural point of aim. So take your time, set all of your stuff up perfectly. And like I mentioned before, some of the other things to uh, eliminate some of the distractions. So double plugs and muffs to eliminate different sounds depending on where you're at and make sure the sun's not in your eyes and, and uh, causing some sort of distraction there as well. So all these little things just add up to making a more accurate shot downrange. And one other thing I like to keep track of when I'm doing any sort of ballistic testing is the velocity. So it's been mentioned in the comments and someone brought up a really good point. Magneto speeds are very, very popular. They're easy to use, they're compact, and they just work phenomenally. The biggest downfall to the magneto speed is you're attaching something to the barrel. And like we talked about in another episode, that can affect the harmonic vibrations going down the barrel and change your point of impact. So I always like to use my lab radar since it doesn't have any effect on the harmonics of my barrel and I still collect the velocity data as I'm shooting. One thing to think about is how many rounds you're going to shoot at each range. So there's the argument three shots versus five shots or more. And what I have to say about that is, it's whatever you're comfortable with. So if you're comfortable with having three shots and you think all three of those shots are good and you pulled that trigger perfectly with the sights aligned where you want them to be, then that's good. That should give you an idea of where your center point of impact is at that range. If you wanna shoot five shot groups, the only thing I would say is, this allows for a greater potential of human error. So the more you shoot, the greater the potential that you're gonna jerk the trigger or do something else that's gonna affect your point of impact down range. So just keep that in mind. And if you're shooting groups of three and you have a flyer or a pulled shot or something like that that you know should be ruled out, go ahead and send another one. One more thing that's important to make sure that we do is use a big enough target. I've done this before when I've shot out to 800 to 1,000 yards and I just put up an eight and a half by 11 sheet and my dope was way off. So then I'm sending rounds down range and I'm not spotting my impact on the paper. So it leads to a lot of frustration. So I like to use the largest target that I can and a good size aiming point so that you can still pick it up at whatever distance you're shooting, but it allows for a fine aiming point at that distance, if that makes sense. As we're evaluating our groups, we wanna make sure that we do our very best to find the center average of the group that we shot in relation to the point of aim. And measure, usually I'll bring a tape measure or something like that, to measure the deviation from your point of aim from your center average point of impact. And then that's how we make our adjustments later on to our dope. So convert that to mils or MOA or whatever unit of measure you're shooting in, take that back to the firing line, make that small adjustment and fire five more rounds or three more rounds or whatever you're going to shoot. 
and you wanna make sure that you make note of your adjustments and whatever you're changing. So later on, you can replicate this by changing your ballistic trajectory to match what you're actually seeing during this validation period. I mentioned before it was important to know where our supersonic to transonic transition was, as well as our transonic to subsonic transition in terms of range. So generally speaking, when I validate my trajectory, I'll shoot my rounds at the threshold of these transition ranges. So for example, if my transition range from supersonic to transonic is 800 yards, then I'd probably shoot at 750 yards or, or somewhere close. That way you make sure that your bullet is stable at that point. And similarly, I'll shoot down into the subsonic range somewhere like Mach 0.6 to Mach 0.8. So that gives you a good idea of how your bullet's gonna react, as I mentioned before, in the subsonic range. Once we have our trajectory validated, we take this information back home and then we can use that information to manipulate our trajectory curve to fit what we just experienced in the field. So there's a couple ways of doing this. We can manipulate the velocity and we can also manipulate the ballistic coefficient. So I mentioned before that we have the G1 and G7. So typically G1 is for the flat base bullets and G7 is for bowtail bullets. That's a kind of a general rule, not a hard and fast rule. So it's worth it to play around with those two ballistic coefficients and see if one lines up with what you're seeing in the field better than the other. Those are all ways we can change the output of our ballistic program to match what you're actually seeing in the field. So we can take our ballistic coefficient, for example, and go up or down with that number and see what effect it has on our ballistic curve. And likewise with velocity, small increases and decreases in velocity can have big effects downrange. So it's just a matter of playing with these two variables and figuring out what works for you. Generally speaking, velocity doesn't have as great of an effect on our trajectory below Mach 1.2. So from the point of where the bullet is fired to Mach 1.2, I'll use velocity to true my ballistic curve in that range. Below Mach 1.2, so 1.2 down to whatever subsonic range you're shooting out max, I'll use my ballistic coefficient to true that. Now, once again, that's not a hard and fast rule. And you might see that you might need to manipulate both in the supersonic to transonic range in order to make that ballistic curve match up. A couple other things that we can also manipulate that have a difference down range that we saw in our previous video is we can change our scope height or our scope offset from the bore. So these are all small things that we can use to change the output of our ballistic calculator to match up with what we're seeing. And this is very important to do, but you also have to make note of what you're changing and only change one thing at a time. So we're not introducing too much change at once and we can't track our variables as we move through the process. One nice thing about using a Kestrel with the applied ballistics software is it'll actually give you the proper range to validate your trajectory. So you shoot at that range, you note the difference between point of A and point of impact, you enter that difference in the Kestrel and it'll true your range up to that point. So it's a very nice feature and it makes things a little easier. So after we get our ballistic data trued, then it's time to put it into one of those nifty charts like I showed you yesterday. So we can put it into one that we tape on a rifle somewhere, we can tape it to our binoculars, our spotting scope, our tripod. A lot of people print out little cards and I'll 550 cord them to my scope rings or with a rubber band on my scope rings, but somewhere where this data is readily available for a quick glance when you're out in the field. So that's it for today, guys, short and sweet. Unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to shoot today just because of the weather, but what I wanna do here in the near future is run you guys through this validation process in the field with an actual newly developed load for a rifle so we can see exactly how it goes on, exactly what we're seeing in the target, and how to make those changes to our data in our ballistic program and get the right output. So we'll do that very soon, I promise. But for now, thanks for watching guys. Hope you have a good weekend.